Rabia al-Adawiya, born in 717 and died in 801. Although Islamic history is replete with heroic deeds performed by Muslim women, unfortunately the majority of Islamic historians have failed to acknowledge their contributions to the development of Islamic thought, culture and civilization. Far from being on the margins of society, during the early days of Islam, Muslim women played an important role within the Muslim community founded by the Prophet in Medina. Indeed, the first person to embrace Islam was Khadija, the wife of the Prophet, and she stood by him steadfastly during the very difficult and challenging period in Islamic history. As an intelligent and fabulously wealthy lady, she placed all her wealth and properties at the disposal of the Prophet in order to strengthen and consolidate Islam within Meccan society. Her devotion and dedication to, and sacrifices made for, Islam were second to none. Following in Khadija's footsteps, other distinguished women like Fatima bint Muhammad, Um Atiya, Asma bint Abu Bakr, Um Amara, Asma bint Yazid, Hafsa bint Umar, and Aisha bint Abu Bakr became important figures in the early Muslim community. They excelled in many different spheres of human endeavour. Some performed heroic deeds on the battlefield. Others became masters of Islamic thought and scholarship, while yet others played an active part in the social political affairs of the early Muslim community. The example set by these prominent women later inspired other Muslim women to contribute and achieve as much as they did. One such remarkable woman was Rabi al Adawiya, who is today considered to be one of the most famous and most influential female spiritual figures in Islam, along with Khadija, Aisha, and Fatima. Rabi al Adawiya, known as Rabi al Basri, was born in the Iraqi city of Basra, although very little is known about her early life. According to her biographers Farid al-Din Attar and Ibn Khaliqan, she was born into a poor family belonging to the Al-Atiq tribe of the Qais Ibn Adi clan of Basra. This explains why the word Al-Adawiyah or Al-Qasiya are often attached to her name. Rabia's parents died while she was still a child and to make matters worse, famine then struck Basra and this forced her to endure considerable personal hardship and suffering. Although it's not clear whether she had any brothers or sisters, some scholars like Anne-Marie Chamel have argued that the name Rabia, fourth, suggests she may have been the fourth child of her parents. However, this view is only speculation, as there's no historical evidence to prove it. But in his famous Tadkhira al-Awliya, Memoirs of the Saints, Farid al-Din Attar, the celebrated biographer and poet, states that during the famine, young Rabia, having been displaced from her family, fell into the hands of an unscrupulous trader who sold her into slavery for six dirhams. The man who purchased her not only treated her badly, but also forced her to work round the clock without any respite. And in desperation, she tried to escape from a bondage, but her attempts proved unsuccessful. Eventually she accepted her condition and became a devout Muslim. She worked as a slave labourer during the daytime and stayed awake at night to perform supererogatory nafal prayers. The more Rabia prayed, the more devout she became until she began to fast during the day and spend the whole night in prayer. Her devotion and dedication to God reached such intensity that once, when our master woke up in the middle of the night, he found him prostration, saying, O oh my Lord, you know that the desires of my heart is to obey you, and that the light of my eyes is in the service of your court. If the matter rested with me, I should not cease for one hour from your service. For you have made me subject to a creature. Moved by her unflinching faith and piety, her master freed her, the very next morning, and then she went into the desert where she stayed with the Bedouins for a period. Eventually she returned to Basra 
and lived in a tiny apartment, and devoted the rest of her life to prayer, fasting and other devotional activities. Given that Rabia's early life and her religious teachings and practices became entangled with miraculous tales and supernatural stories, even a discerning scholar and poet like Farid al-Din Attar could not help but incorporate some of them in his work. Indeed, in his Tadkhira al-Awliya, he related that during her stay in the desert, Rabia, having decided to perform the sacred Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca, set out for Mecca. But after travelling some distance, her donkey, which was carrying all her luggage, suddenly dropped dead. And at this, her fellow pilgrims offered to carry her load. But she declined, saying she'll only accept God's help. When the other travellers continued their journey to Mecca, leaving her behind, she fell to the ground and cried, Oh God, do kings deal thus with a woman? A stranger? And a weak? You're calling me to see your house in the Gaba, but in the middle of the journey, you killed my donkey, and you left me alone in the desert. And as soon as she finished her supplication, the donkey apparently jumped up, alive once more, and Rabia was able to continue her journey to Mecca. According to Attar, on another occasion, when she was travelling to Mecca for the pilgrimage, halfway through her journey, she apparently saw the Gaba coming towards her, aware she remarked, It is the lord of the house whom I need. What have I to do with this house? I need to meet with him, my lord, who said, Whoso approaches me by the span's length, I will approach him by the length of a cubit. The Gaba which I see has no power over me. What joy does the beauty of the Gaba bring to me? Farid al-Din Attar and her other biographies have ascribed these and many other miraculous and supernatural stories to her. But frankly, these tales are no more than myth and legend. Thus, they have no historical value or literary veracity. Indeed, the absence of first-hand information about her life and religious teachings led to the proliferation of such mythical tales and stories. Suffice to say, that Rabia became fascinated by Islam from a very early age and thereafter regularly engaged in meditation and other devotional activities. As a result, she gained profound insight into Islamic teachings and spirituality, but she always kept her feet firmly on the ground and never claimed to be special. As one of Islam's earliest mystics, she renounced all worldly comforts in favour of asceticism, Zud. She also made a conscious decision not to marry, and remained a confirmed spinster all her life. When Abd al-Wahid ibn Zayd, who was an eminent Islamic scholar, a practising Sufi, and a self-confessed ascetic of Basra, sent her a marriage proposal, she rebuked him, saying, Oh, sensual one, seek another sensual like yourself. Have you seen any sign of desire in me? Then she recited the following couplets. The ways are various. The way to the truth is one. Those who travel on the way to truth must keep themselves apart. It was not long before Rabia's piety and asceticism won her much acclaim in and around Basra. This also prompted many influential men like Muhammad ibn Suleiman al-Hashimi, the ruler of Basra, to send marriage proposals to her. Al-Hashimi even offered her a handsome dowry of 100,000 dinars and a generous monthly stipend of 10,000 dinars. But she shunned him, saying, It doesn't please me that you should be my slave and that all you possess should be mine or that you should distract me from God for a single moment. According to biographers Farid al-Din Attar and Abd al-Rauf al-Munawi, even Hassan al-Basri, the famous Muslim theologian and mystic of Basra, proposed to Rabia, but she turned him down as well, saying, Renunciation of this world means peace, while desire for it brings sorrow. Curb your desires and control yourself, and don't let others control you, but let them share your inheritance and the anxiety of age. As for yourself, give your, give your mind to the day of death. But as for me, God can give me all you offer and even double it. It does not please me to be distracted from him, not for one single moment.
so farewell. However, all reports connecting Hassan al-Basri to Rabia have been dismissed by historians as being unreliable, if not fabricated, because she was barely 10 when Hassan al-Basri died in 728, at the ripe old age of 86. As such, he could not have proposed to her. Nonetheless, it is true that Rabia led a scrupulously clean and pious life, sanctified by extreme poverty, self-denial and a refusal to marry or experience worldly pleasures and comforts in any form. Her sole objective in life was to transcend from the temporal to the highest spiritual plane through single-minded devotion and dedication to God. And in so doing, she became immersed in the ocean of divine love and gnosis. This, according to Rabia, was more satisfying and enduring than the transient joys and comforts of this world. Unlike Hassan al-Basri's religious ideas and thoughts, which were invariably influenced by notions of hellfire and eternal damnation, Rabia's mystical philosophy so much revolved around the concept of pure divine love that she never failed to emphasize the significance of loving God only for his sake, and in her opinion to obey God out of fear of divine retribution, or to serve and worship him in order to receive a handsome reward was tantamount to selfishness. Rather, she advocated that one should love God only for his sake, without any fear of his punishment or hope for reward. This, according to Rabia, was pure divine love, which she eloquently expressed in some of her most famous prayers. For example, she used to say, O God, if I worship you for fear of hell, then burn me in hell. And if I worship you for hope of paradise, well then exclude me from paradise. But if I worship you, you for your own sake, grudge me not your everlasting beauty. On another occasion she prayed, I love you with two loves, a selfish love and a love that you are worthy of. As for the selfish love, it is that I think of you to the exclusion of everything else. And as for the love that you are worthy of, ah, that I no longer see any creature, but I see only you. There is no praise for me in either of these types of loves, but the praise in both is for you. Despite being illiterate, Rabia was a very beautiful and eloquent Arabic speaker. She used to express her feelings for God in the form of poetry and prayers, and did so in a very passionate and powerful way. When her contemporaries told her that her notion of pure divine love was very novel, she recited the following verse from the Quran. He loves them and they love him in chapter 5 verse 59. And, O you, soul at peace, return to your Lord, well pleased with yourself and well pleasing unto him. Chapter 89 verses 27 and 28. Her profound knowledge and understanding of the Qur'an and prophetic wisdom coupled with her illuminating exposition of Islamic values and spirituality turned her into a powerful symbol of Islamic purity and virtue even during her own lifetime. Indeed, when her devotional and ascetic practices became too excessive, her close friends and disciples like Sufyan al tawri Rabba al-Qais, Shakik al-Balqi, and Malik ibn Dinar urged her to rest. But she responded by saying, I should be ashamed to ask for this world's good for him to whom it belongs. And how should I seek them from those to whom it does not belong? And then she goes on to add, Will God forget the poor because of their poverty or remember the rich because of their riches? Since he knows my state, what have I to remind him of? Whatever God wills, we should also will. Rabia's notion of pure divine love to the exclusion of all others later became known as Rabia's Sidq or absolute sincerity and total reliance upon God. And this also became the central pillar of a religious thought and mystical philosophy which influenced and inspired generations of Sufis. Thanks to Rabia's love for and single-minded devotion to God, and Hassan al-Basri's eloquent exposition of traditional Islamic values and practices, the tide of materialism 
and hedonism, which threatened to overwhelm the Muslim world at a time, was successfully turned back. They also played a pivotal role in reviving and popularizing Islamic spirituality in the form of Sufism or Islamic mysticism. Thereafter, Sufism became a powerful spiritual methodology for those who wished to devote their entire lives to Islamic devotional practices. Inspired by both Rabia and Hassan al-Basri, the message of Sufism attracted hundreds and thousands of followers from all over the world, many of whom in turn became great symbols of Islamic piety and restitude. By virtue of a profound knowledge and understanding of Islam, Rabia became a major source of inspiration for Muslims during her own lifetime, and even more so after her death. Living as we do at a time when anger, hatred and hostility have become so prevalent, her message of love, mercy and compassion could not be more pertinent today. Happily, many books and treaties have been written on the life and thought of this remarkable Muslim woman by some of the Muslim world's leading scholars and writers, including Farid al-Din al-Attar, Abdur Rahman Jami, Ibn Khalikan, and Abdur Rahman Ibn Ali Ibn al-Jawzi. So there is no shortage of works on her life and thought. Likewise, in the West, the prominent British poet, Richard Mockton Milnes, became one of the first to publish a small collection of poems under the title the sayings of Rabia during the 19th century, and thereafter Margaret Smith's seminal biography entitled Rabia, the Mystic, and her fellow saints in Islam, was published in 1922. And this book is a detailed and illuminating study of her life, thoughts and achievements. Rabia, the great mystical thinker and Sufi saint of Islam, died around the age of 84 and was buried in a native Basra,